Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And, you know, last weekend we did a big stream about cancel culture on the channel. And, you know, it was a very good conversation. You know, had uh, uh, Doug Ernst on the channel, had Neon from um, Clownfish TV, Aaron Sparrow, editor in the comic book industry. Well, another guest was supposed to maybe join us, but he was out of town, you know, on a trip. And I wanted to have David Stewart on the channel and maybe talk about cancel culture. You know, you cover it on your channel a lot, and, you know, I, I wanted to get some of your thoughts out there just in case my viewers haven't, uh, you know, heard kind of some of your ideas. And I know, how would you define cancel culture? So I would define it as it's the moral argument that due to some speech or action that somebody has done in the past or some opinion that they hold, they should be ineligible to work. That's basically what it is. And for the most part, we notice it in the media industry. So somebody has an opinion that's considered politically not okay by some group. And so therefore he shouldn't be allowed to work anymore. Uh, that's really what it comes down to. So if somebody's, uh, you know, if they're working in the movie industry and uh, they think, you know, abortion's not okay, then they shouldn't be allowed to ever make movies again. That's really what council culture comes down to. So you're canceling the person, not the, uh, not the show necessarily. Yeah, because their their I idea is wrong, and it, I think there's a, another part of it, you know, where people want to um, maybe show that they have power that maybe not authority power, but try and, and put power on people that maybe uh, are in a position of, of prominence and things of that nature as well. Yeah, I think it has to do with the nature of public relations. Um, PR firms and corporations in general are very afraid of, of public opinion being negative in some ways. PR looks at the optionality of a situation, especially if it's like, let's say you have, I don't know, like a comic artist that is working on on some run of a, of a book. And uh, they look at it and they say, well, that artist is actually replaceable. Because we, you know, we own whatever that that run is. The optionality is usually to cancel the person because that will shut up the mob for now, and then it will uh, it'll allow you to continue trying to sell the product. Usually with not a lot of consequences because a lot of people are they're not super aware of it or they're not going to say boycott over cancel culture. Um, it's just a threat of a lot of negative attention towards something uh, that PR firm, PR firms are generally. Um, unaware of so people that are really into it and it, it happens a lot on twitter in particular uh I don't, you know there's always mobs of people that will um spam about some the evil of somebody's opinion until the uh, and really it's like they go to their employer you know this person maybe they work up in the movie industry you, you spam the studio that employs them until they get fired and uh, that's the goal you know it's to have that it is like you said to have that power over a person because they're not the employer you know, they're like, I wish that I could fire this person. So how can I get this person fired? Because they're bad. Mm -hmm. And you, know, I think a lot of people kind of more associated now with the left. I remember as a kid, most of where you would see it come from was actually like churches. I remember my church, uh, the, the one I attended, we, you know, we, we, we had a, a nice CD burning night one night when I had like a friend come with me, which is pretty embarrassing. Yeah. I've, I've and, heard uh, that. Stuff. It, We're going to burn the so, secular so it's music. Like, yeah. Yeah, they um, yeah. didn't like rock music. Yeah, so um, I'd say there's there's two. First of all, it can come from the right. Now it's mostly from the left, and I think that that's a product of social media and like the fact that um, people on the right don't swarm as much, you know. But people on the left are really happy to like not just not just swarm virtually, like okay, we're gonna all swarm this person on Twitter, but uh, to to go protest. People on the right just don't seem to protest very much, and I don't really know why that is. I don't know what the difference in uh, mentality is there. Uh, the The most recent one that I can think of that sh that's really from the right was James Gunn, who was the director of Guardians of the Galaxy, the first two Guardians of the Galaxy movies, and I think I think he'll do the third one. I think he got his job back. Mm -hmm. But somebody, um, I think Mike Cernovich was the one who really blew it up, but went and dug up these old deleted tweets from 10 years ago that were making a bunch of pedophile jokes, right? Like jokes about mm -hmm. liking little kids or something between him and another person. And actually some of them weren't even the tweets he did. It was, uh, it was a, it was a thing he used to do on Twitter where make it look like somebody else tweeted something and people do it to each other as a joke. Um, 
just kind of like how if you if you're clever with chat, you can make it look like somebody else said something in chat if you know how to like do the spacing right, something like that. So um, basically, Disney now Disney already knew about this and he already apologized about these tweets, but because of this like swarm of people demanding that he get fired um, for being you know a pedophile, they fired him. You know they they got rid of him and he. Uh, a lot of people were actually, and I, I got a lot of pushback when I said like, Hey man, this like firing people over jokes is not okay. It's like, well, he wanted Roseanne Barr fired. It's like, and so he got what was coming to him. It's like, it's true. You know, he, he was, uh, he was part of cancel culture and then it came back and bit him too. And so mm -hmm. it can come from the other direction, but nowadays I mostly see it from the left. I think just due to, to social media. And I think in the past, like the CD burning, you know, this, we're going to burn the secular CDs, which to me was always like really disturbing. Uh, that's not calling up the record company and demanding that that artist be pulled from the record company or, you know, like unemployed. And so what regular people should, I think the reason why a lot of regular people kind of recoil from this is because we have jobs, you know, and, and the idea of somebody calling up our employer and demanding we get fired is, uh, awful like why why would i get fired for saying for making a facebook post or something but that's kind of where we're at and in fact i've had people contact my employer in the past because of things i've said online now i'm, I'm completely self-employed now so there's no one to call but uh it, you know when i was a teacher it's like it's like we had people calling saying that you were a nazi or something we just thought it was a they thought it was like kids from the school prank calling i'm like no it's probably someone online figured out that I worked here and then they're trying to call you to get me fired or send you emails or something. It's like, it's, it just wasn't uh, like, because of where I worked, they just didn't really know anything about my online activities. So it just didn't occur to them that that was what was happening. But um, yeah, we have a natural kind of recoiling to the idea that somebody's just going to call up your employer and get you fired. Like that's an awful idea. Yeah, so I know when, when DC did their vertigo, you know, relaunch, one of the books that they, that they were launching was from a guy named Mark Russell and it was called second coming. And it was basically uh, Jesus Christ is like roommates. And it was maybe implied that maybe he had a relationship with another man called, like, called sun man or solar man, something like that. And it was going to be, you know, kind of uh, taking the piss out of Christians and their, their beliefs and stuff like that. I myself am a, am a Christian and, and people were you know, calling for it to be canceled. I was like, man, I, I don't like that idea. I would rather it just get published and let it die or get canceled because nobody wanted to read it. You know, put the idea out there and let it, you know, be out there in the in the court of public opinion and see if if people gravitate to it or or, or if they want to experience that. And and that's how I would like to see it. I would like to see see those ideas compete with other ideas and see who wins. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, the great thing is we do live in a time where even you know you can always put out your ideas. There's it's it's very open. There's. Uh, there's very little restriction. So if like, if DC didn't want to publish it, he could have published it himself. Um, well, he ended not, up getting published by Ahoy Comics, another okay. very small publisher. Yeah. So there's always like some other option. Now, um, I think to understand cancel culture, you have to understand that you're, you know, you're, you're really dealing with a moral argument. And especially when you're thinking like a publisher, say publisher writer relationship um, is that, the publisher, I think from my perspective, the publisher is just a company that wants to make money, right? <laughs> you know, yes. they want to make money. And so they're going to do the things that make the money. Um, and I don't think of them as like a moral arbiter necessarily of what they're publishing. They're just publishing things that they think people might want to read um, and things that maybe fit their brand. And, and, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that. Uh, so I don't usually think of publishers as having any kind of moral stamp on it, but that's not what some people think some people think that that relationship that the the publisher's not just a company that's trying to put out things that people want to read to make money rather the publisher has a moral relationship with the uh the items which they're publishing and the person with whom they're interacting with so if they're going to publish something that is morally bad because you got to think that for a lot of people on the left ideas certain ideas are morally bad it's not just that they're wrong they're bad and that's um, that's something that you really have to to recognize. So if they're going to publish something that has bad ideas, now that publisher is is morally approving of the morally bad idea, and they should be aware of that idea being bad or the person being bad, so that they can, 
you know, they can do their appropriate penance to the social justice gods by firing the person who is bad. And then, you know, they'll usually follow up by like donating to some charity, right? Some, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And it's always kind of like a woke charity, like, you know, the, the women in media fund or something like that, you know, they'll donate a couple, they'll throw a couple bucks at it to, to try to get people to quiet down. Um, and I do want to say though, that here's the thing about cancel culture and the, the swarming and stuff is that if it works one time, they'll never stop doing it. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, I that's remember correct. with, with uh, Scarlett Johansson, there was, there was a movie. It was yeah. about like, I, I believe a, a trans man, that yeah, a woman uh, because, a owned woman a strip club or something like that. And, you know, it was going to be a small independent movie, likely only got financed and approved for production because Scarlett Johansson was attached to it. You know, he had a big A-list star, but she herself wasn't trans. And that yeah. itself, the idea that, that a, um, a female would play a trans man character rather than a trans male uh, actor play that character was so offensive, it, it had to be wiped out. And Scarlett Johansson is one of the most, powerful you know actresses in hollywood yeah yeah she based that that i'm trying to remember the name of the project but yeah it basically got approved simply because she was attached to do it and of course as an actor or an actress that's a that's kind of an attractive job because it really stretches your you know kind of stretches your reach it's an interesting role to play as somebody that's that's trans i could see why she would want to do that not just for woke reasons but just for professional reasons it's just be an interesting job now what's also interesting is that the the person that she was going to be portraying is not uh was not a trans man taking hormones and things like that um so it really couldn't have been played by a trans man that's the that's kind of the kicker it's like it couldn't have accurately been played by somebody who has transitioned to being male because that person would have been taking um testosterone and hormones which would which would have made that person look like you and me Right. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have been appropriate for the part. It really had to be played by a female because of the actual character. You know, it's kind of like um, the movie Boys Don't Cry. Uh, who was in that one? Uh, it was the actress from the Spike next Karate movie. Kid. Yeah. Um, so Boys Don't Cry was about a girl, you know, basically pretending to be a boy um, and being found out that she was that she wasn't really a boy. Now, that actually couldn't have been done by a trans male for that specific reason. You know, it, it wouldn't have worked. Uh, it just wouldn't have Hillary worked. Swank. Yeah. Hillary Swank. That's it. And so it was, you know, it, I, I, uh, I think it's, it's probably a, a pretty good example of what we're talking about is like that couldn't, you couldn't do it with it, with the trans male. It was more appropriate to do it that way, but you probably couldn't get that movie made now for that reason. It just like no, you have to give that opportunity to trans to a to a trans actor. That's the argument that I heard. I'm like, okay, well, now there's no opportunity for a trans actor because the movie doesn't. Because yeah, <laughs> I actually got into a, I wouldn't say an argument, but I was like, well, you know, Scarlett Johansson is not as associated with this movie. It's probably not going to get made. Would you rather it just not get made? And the and the person was vehement. No, it it must be made with a trans actor. And I was like, well. What if that's not an option? Do, do you not should that portrayal not be out there that story? And uh, they couldn't fathom the idea of what I was presenting to them. It was the only thing that mattered was that the a trans character or actor played the character. And I said, but but now the movie won't get made. And of course, it hasn't been made. And it was called Rub and Tug. Yeah, yeah. It's um, you know, you're making a pragmatic argument against the moral argument, and they just kind of like fly past each other. I think. So that's something you have to recognize about cancel cultures. They're always they're always trying to operate on the moral plane, not a pragmatic plane, and um, they're never really going to operate with the morals. And, and so their their idea of free speech is going to be a little bit different. Where I'm like, my idea of free speech is the ability to communicate. That means like, so if I pick up my phone and call a friend, I should be able to talk to that friend because that's the nature of communication. Not well. Free speech means you can talk to your friend, but not on the phone, not on the internet. Not, it's like, well, then that's that I don't really have speech, do I? If I can't publish my work, then I don't really have the 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 free speech that other people have. You know, as a creator, you you wrote written a lot of books on uh, uh, yourself. You, you obviously have your YouTube channel. You know, I know there's like it feels like there's a watchdog group of people like concern trolls. And, and they will reach out to to writers and stuff to make sure that they maybe they got a sympathy writer 
to make mm-hmm. sure that the, all the ideas that they put on paper will offend no one. And I yeah, just think have- freedom of speech is the freedom to offend people. Yeah, it's and so they'll have publishers now. Uh, book publishers have diverse, uh, not diversity readers. Um, I'm trying to remember what they're called. Basically, they're readers that are going to be hyper focused on anything that's offensive. Um, I, I, and so anything that could like trigger somebody, um, that's what they. That's what they. Um, that's what they read. But was a sympathy reader for some reason. Yeah, there, it's another word that I'm another thinking. word. <laughs> another word. It's it's a. Uh, um, Anyway, but their their whole thing is like, let's say you write a book, and if there's like bad stereotypes in it, uh, sensitivity reader, maybe that's it. Yeah, there you go. That's what it is. Sensitivity reader. So they come in, and, you know, this could offend somebody because you're portraying a woman doing this. Um, personally, as an artist, I, I am that I find that like abhorrent. <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. want somebody to. I and so if if you're it even with, censored. Yeah, if you're working with a big publisher and you get you'll have an editor come back and say, you know, our sensitivity reader is really concerned about this section. Can you rewrite it? And maybe it's not a big deal, but maybe it's like, well, that's something really essential about about the character. I remember um Joss Whedon got freaking mobbed and had to leave Twitter because he had Black Widow express um some sadness about not being able to have children. Yeah. That's that was actually a, one of the more emotional parts of that entire movie. Yeah, and it's a really human expression. And it's mm-hmm. like not being able to have children, it's like a regret. It's like I have this life, but I can't have children, you know. And, uh, you know, especially with like a relationship with Hawkeye in those movies where he has the family, you know. It's, uh, you know, it, it has a big impact. But because she's expressing regret over not being able to have a family, that's that's not expressing feminist values. Right, like women are more than just childbearing receptacles. It's like he never said that. That it's just this is a human moment because having children's part of the human experience. Like I certainly would never trade my children for anything, and I think you feel the same way about your kids. Absolutely. So the idea of like if I were of the same age and I haven't had kids, yeah, I would probably have regrets about not having kids. If I were if I were in the same place, I'd be like, man, I really wish. I feel like maybe there's something missing in my life, and it's too bad I couldn't have kids. If I have some kind of sad feeling about that that's just a human also, you know it conveys the the point that being a hero comes at a cost and her cost was being able to have a family you know and part of her life and you know and uh you know tony's cost is you know is somewhat insanity you know he becomes an alcoholic and stuff like that you know being a hero just isn't isn't all great things you know there is a cost associated with it and, yeah. and you know and that was her penance to bear it was a huge yeah. emotional moment yeah and actually you know for that same reason i actually really enjoyed iron man three i know a lot of people didn't but i i like that they made him more human and that he was having anxiety attacks and had to really consider like what he was doing and what he was giving up to have it uh that made me like that character more and actually enjoyed the movie more he couldn't have done just like another iron man movie that wouldn't have been that just wouldn't have been as interesting as going mm-hmm. in that other direction so i i kind of like that now i had a, a similar thing with one of my books with um water of awakening now i have a female protagonist in this book and so you know at one point um you know she has this big regret because she feels like she has to give up having kids and having the family and having the life that she had just begun with her husband before he got this bizarre illness um that she's trying to cure so it's um it's interesting when I look at that and this was just the way the story came into my head. I'm like a sensitive sensitivity reader might hate this, even though it has, you know, kick ass female protagonist like really doing good stuff. It's also like she's motivated to save her husband. Like, why should you care about saving her? You know, I could just imagine the 30 lines of of uh how awful it was that she cared about saving her husband or wanted to be a wife, wanted to have kids, things like that. It's like that's I made her female. And so the female perspective, I think family is part of that. Females have a little bit different perspective on that than males. It's not completely alien to each other. We can both understand it. You know, why not have that in there? It's sort her- of weird. Some people find it offensive that you would have a female protagonist in your book because you're yeah. not female yourself. How could you understand how, how she could be heroic or what her struggle is? Yeah. Yeah. That's another one too. Um, maybe that's, I've, well, I've had people object to having a female protagonist in that, like, I'm too woke as well. Like, Why would you have a female protagonist? I'm like, I wanted one. I don't know. 
I, I, I don't dislike female protagonists. There's nothing wrong with having like a female main character. What it's like, well, and then that's the other one. How could you understand women? It's like, that's, I live my life around women all the time. I hope I can understand them on some level, you know, <laughs> otherwise we got a problem yeah. or that somebody can't identify with someone different from them. This is an, mm -hmm. another new idea I've had. You know, I've had people who like watching my write streams and stuff say, hey, you know, I had someone suggest that I, you know, when I write this story, I don't specify whether the character is male or female. And I'm like, that's an essential quality of every human. It's like where they're, you know, whether they're male or female. It's like, well, then whoever's reading it can just impress upon that character however, however they feel. I'm like, I don't, I don't take that line of reasoning that because a protagonist is different from you, you can't identify with them or understand their struggles or like, like them, you know, that would be like saying, I can't, I can't enjoy a Will Smith movie because he's black and I'm not black. How could I understand that black character's perspective? It's like, I understand it because it's being presented in the story. The story exists for me to understand his perspective, not, you know, not to, uh, not, not to be just for people that are exactly like the characters being presented. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm with you. When you, when you watch men in black, i I do not uh, relate to Tommy Lee Jones' character, the, the old stiff guy. I relate to Will Smith, the, the young cool guy that, that wants yeah. to do things a little different. Yeah. Yeah, and he doesn't have to be exactly like me for me to identify with his feelings about those things. You know, I get it. And and part, mm -hmm. of, the, part of a good storytelling job is communicating a character that's different from the reader to the reader. It's kind of why readers like to read things because the characters aren't them, you know? Um, Captain Ahab is an interesting character because he, I'm not Captain Ahab. He's very different from me. So mm -hmm. he's more interesting that way. Same thing with, you know, any kind of hero. Um, uh, you know, one of my favorites, uh, of course, and this, this goes not just over the novel realm, but the comic realm as well is, is Elric, right? I'm nothing like Elric. And, and the whole idea of Michael Moorcock when he was writing Elric books or comics was Elric is not human. He's very different from us. And he's, thinks humans are weirds and is trying to understand their strange sensibilities. That's what makes him interesting. Yeah. Same with Spock. Yeah. And Spock too. He sees humanity in a completely different light, you know, completely logical. And you can see why nothing makes sense. Yeah. To him. Or data or data in, in the next mm -hmm. generation. I love data because data is always trying to figure out people. And so he's, he's a reflection of, of ourselves. You know, it's um, an outsider trying to explain humanity to himself. I was I always found so, that it to be a really interesting character. I know you know you do all of your own books, you self-publish and all that stuff. So you probably don't you know quite have the same amount of uh, pressure or heat on you as, as far as not being able to offend. But do you see this? You know, is this one of the reasons why entertainment seems a lot more milk toast? You know, nowadays everything seems very formulaic. Even you know you look at the MCU and everything seems to have. Uh, become very formulaic over time. There's nothing, not a lot of interesting things being presented anymore because nobody wants to offend or, or present ideas that could be controversial. Um, so I think there's still, I mean, there's still a lot of controversial stuff that comes out. Um, but if you're looking at like the big media companies, you, you might be onto something. I, I really think it all comes down to money. Mm -hmm. um, and then that includes cancel culture. I mean, the companies don't cancel people because they you know, corporations are not people. It's not because they are convinced by the the rhetoric coming from the cancelers that they have a moral obligation to get rid of a, a bad thinker, but because they don't want to suffer the financial consequences of, of continuing to employ that person when they view that person as replaceable on some level. You know, a, a corporation is going to look at all the talent that they hire as more or less replaceable. There's tons of talent in the world. There's no singular amazing talent. Now, the only exception might be something like a, a Johnny Depp kind of actor that that actor will bring so much money to a movie that it's like, you really have to think twice about trying to cancel. You know, after that, there was like the Johnny Depp's had a crazy divorce, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, things came to light. Of course, he was accused of abuse. And so there was a strong push to like cancel him. And even Disney, who's very PR conscious, didn't want to do it because they're like, we pay him, you know, $50 million in a movie because he brings in like 300 million, just him being in the movie. It's really, 
you know, very few people have that amount of weight where like a company will think twice, especially if it's somebody who's not visible, like a director, like James Gunn or anyone. Um, if, if they, they're going to view the talent as replaceable. So there's the optionality is tends to be towards, if you're looking at a singular event, optionality is towards replacing someone. Um, and then of course, it's also, you get these milk toast ideas because there's so much like with the movie, for example, there's so much money invested in the movie to begin with, like $200 million that the, and this is a, this is kind of a decision sciences sort of thing. As you up the amount of risk, as you up the amount of money you're risking, the tolerance for risk goes down. So by the time you get to $200 million, it's like, we have to do the things which will guarantee us at least we make our money back. They're not really rolling the dice. They're not taking a lot of chances with movies, um, with a lot of the big movies anyways. That's why there's so many remakes. And it's why, you know, they can remake something and then like drain, drain what made the original good out of it for the same reason is that there's just, you know, you don't want to roll the dice. It's too much risk to, to lose money on, on something really big. So it, it, I think if studios went back to what kind of what they did in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there was lots of small and mid-budget movies that they rolled the dice on. Um, yeah, you only had a few blockbusters in the summer. You know, you get one or two a month, and now it's you get one every week, and sometimes you might get two, and the summer yeah. ski, season's gotten longer. Yeah, George, George Lucas actually predicted this like 10 or 20 years ago. He's like, movies are going to go to these super premium products. And everyone's like, George, you're crazy. Oh, well, it happened. He knew what he was mm -hmm. talking about, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it comes down to some of that risk. Now, I will say I want to I want to go back to an idea, which is for that singular event, the optionality is towards canceling the person because the corporation is going to view that person as replaceable. But once once the swarming works, they're going to continue to do it. And that's a point I want to hammer home is that if you, this is why if, if ever you are, anyone's watching this and they're getting pressure to fire somebody or to disassociate with somebody because that person is, you know, bad on, for some moral reason, this usually they believe things differently from other people. Um, consider that if you do that, it's, it's the old saying, um, by Rudyard Kipling. Once you have paid the Dane, once you have paid the Dane Guild, you never get rid of the Dane. You never get rid of the Dane. Once you have paid the Dane Guild, you never get rid of the Dane. And that goes back to medieval England, where the the Danes that had basically conquered England would demand that you pay them money so they wouldn't come over and conquer you. And so if you paid the money, the next you know they'd be like, great, we won't conquer you. And then they come back a few months later and be like, can we? Would you like to give us more money, or we'll conquer you? <laughs> so once you give them the money one time, then they know that you're good for the good to take the money from it. So it's the same thing. Once you give into it once, they're gonna they're gonna continue to do it. Um, the other thing and is the threshold always changed. Once yeah. once you do it one time, the goalpost just moves up a little bit more. The the threshold of, of what it takes from the outrage to warrant the cancellation just it, be, it almost becomes nothing. Yeah, it just it's gonna move to the next um, it a whim. The next point. Yeah, um, it's kind of a. Maybe not goalposts, but it's like a football game. You know, the line of scrimmage moves forward and forward. Mm -hmm. So you're like, you, you're like, okay, well, well, you know, you retreat back and back and back until eventually you're not, you know, you have nowhere left to stand. There's there's nowhere left to stand. So um, this is why I say usually don't apologize, never apologize. And people are like, what? Of course you should apologize. Normal. If you're talking to normal people about normal things, yes, apologize. If I, if I accidentally say something offensive to a friend, obviously. You should apologize, right? Because they're a normal person. You have a normal relationship on the internet. If someone demands that you apologize, don't apologize because they look at, first of all, it's a sign of weakness. They're like, this is a soft target. This person is afraid of being canceled. Uh, so let's, let's hit them harder. But also it's an admission of guilt. And so once you apologize for something, then they're going to go to the employer. They're going to go to the publisher and say, look, you wouldn't have apologized if, this wasn't a serious problem or I'm glad you apologize, but you still shouldn't be working in this industry. Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't do anything. And it's the natural human inclination to, um, to apologize for upsetting somebody because we were tribal tribal creatures. We live in families and communities where we care about how other people think about us and, and we care about other people just normally. The internet's not like that. Yeah. It's, it's a polite thing to do, but 
sometimes it, you got to do the not quite thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. So, uh, you know, Dave, David, I, I really appreciate coming on the channel. We do have a couple more minutes. I know you, 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 you told the viewers about one book. Do you have any other books that are coming out right now or anything that you want to yeah. tell them about? So I have a new book coming out. Obviously, I can't show it to you because it hasn't come out yet. It's called The Keys to Prolific Creativity. This is a book on um, creative processes and how to maximize your creative output. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons why you want to maximize your creative output. Number one is you like to have products that come out that people can 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 use. And this is um this is a book that's really directed towards anyone in the creative industries, whether you're an artist or a writer or a musician or a comic artist or a filmmaker. This is really directed towards how to refine your process, how to have a process so that you can complete projects and come out with them. Um, and it goes through a couple things: how to establish the process important mindsets that people don't have when they're, when they're trying to create, um, whatever their product is. So it's got a lot of stuff in there that uh, will help people who are maybe a little bit new to the creative process or just aren't coming out with stuff the way they want to. They feel like they can't finish their book or, um, you know, they feel like the things are never high enough quality to put out. I got a lot of stuff in there for them. So it's all called the keys to prolific creativity. It comes out on March 27th. Other newest book, it's a horror book, actually, straight horror. It's called Eyes in the Walls. Looks like this. Um, you can get the ebook actually for just ninety nine cents. It's a it's kind of a short book. It's only about it's about as long as Old Man in the Sea. If you if you've read that, um, and I'll have an audio book coming out for this at some point too. And actually, if you uh, are a subscriber to my channel, I'll be putting that audio book out one chapter at a time for free uh, until basically it's done. I think I'm gonna let let this one be free for a while on the YouTube channel. So. Um, please do check that out. It's a good little horror read and, um, there's a bunch of others, but, uh, that's, that's the, that's the newest one. Uh, do I have another one that's really new? Newest. Oh, here it is. City of silver. Here's the newest fantasy book. You know, this one last year. Sorry. My, For my people that don't know you put out, it seems like a book, uh, every month, every, you know, six weeks, something like that. Every, every couple months, uh, I put out four last year and I, I felt pretty good about that because of course my wife had a, had a child last year. And so that takes up uh, babies are intense, man. And so, like, uh, so I, the fact that I managed to get some out, so this is a um, city of silver. This is the newest, um, this is the newest fantasy book. So check this one out. This one will be a series. I'll be continuing it this year. And if you join my mailing list, bbspress.com slash list, you'll get this book actually for free. I think maybe a week after you join. And I think the other book you get for free, I don't have it here. It's called City of Silver. It's it, it, it would really please fans of, say, Michael Moorcock or uh, any more dark fantasy kind of fans will like City of uh, – sorry, not City of Silver, uh, Crown, of, Crown of Sight. Mm, yes. That's another one. Okay. So, yep, that's what I got going on right now. I'm really excited about the creativity book. It's my first nonfiction book. I'm hoping it's not going to suck too bad and it's going to have some good information for people. <laughs> So mm -hmm. uh, please do check that out. It's two ninety nine, I think, for the pre-order. Sweet. You know, like I said, thank you very much for joining me. I, I know you do have Thanks thoughts on comic books as well. So so maybe we can get you on here in a few weeks and we can talk about your, your thoughts on like maybe the, the comic book culture and, and things that you've noticed. Yeah, comic book culture is a, a, a lot of – there's a lot to talk about there. And, you know, if, if you want to know my background in comics, it's basically I grew up reading comics in the 80s and 90s. And then I stopped reading them uh, after that mm -hmm. for a long time. And I only recently have really gotten back into getting back issues and checking out new stuff, mostly because, because of guys like you that just are promoting comics to me all the time. And I see them and they look cool. And so I'm like, I gotta, I gotta check some of these out. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a more recent interest a kind of return to, to what I loved when I was, you know, as a kid in the eighties and nineties comics, especially early nineties. That's what I read a lot of. All right. Thanks a lot, buddy. I really appreciate it. Uh-oh. Baby's crying. Yeah. <laughs> I know.